said, I'm Martin Hendry, I'm the Head of Department in Physics and Astronomy at Glasgow University um, and indeed a friend and former colleague of Pippa from many moons ago uh, when she was um, a researcher in uh, Edinburgh in the first instance. I'm sure she'll tell us a bit more about that um, later on. Um, this is my second night of doing Café Sci. Last night was Café Scientifique Francais, so I'm relieved at least to be speaking in English tonight. Um, last night I was telling people about the fact that it's International Year of Light and it's also celebrating 100 years since Albert Einstein developed his general theory of relativity. So I dare say we'll get on perhaps to talking a little bit about that as well tonight. Um, so I'm going to kick things off just by uh, inviting Pippa to, to tell us her thoughts on what sort of astronomy is written about in literature, including her own literature, but looking at more broadly all the way from the hard sci-fi that maybe some of the people with us tonight, like me, will have read, um, all the way through to literature that you wouldn't normally think of as science fiction at all, but it may still have elements of astronomy there featuring in the plot. So we'll hand over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Martin. Um, so it's, it's really nice to be here. Thank you all for coming along. So what I really want to do is uh, start by um, giving some examples of, really nice examples of how astronomy has been used in literature. And I've got a sort of selection of books uh, around my feet. And what I wanted to do really was uh, tell you a little bit about these books and maybe read out a couple of very short extracts um, and this is a bit of a shameless self-promotion. Of course, I've got my own books. So the, the way that we wanted to structure this conversation was that we'd have a bit of a chat um, using some examples from the literature uh, for the next half hour or so. And then we're going to have a bit of a break, an excuse to ha have, a, have a drink, and also uh, an excuse to uh, flog you some books. So um, I, should, I, I just wanted to say a little bit about myself too. Um, I used to be an astronomer. Uh, I used to work in the field of observational cosmology and I did research uh, looking at very distant galaxies for several years and I started writing alongside that and I always really wanted to read literature that investigated uh, real science, actual science that had been done as opposed to the more speculative uh, science. Uh, sort of made up science. Uh, I, I really wanted to read literature that um, kind of had some uh, bearing on my actual day job. So that's partly what uh, sort of influenced tonight's events, really. Uh, the examples of literature that I've found are um, ones that have sort of uh, influenced me strongly, and some of these are quite unusual uh, examples. And so. Um, I think we'll sort of start, I think, just by sort of plunging into uh, one of my favorite books. So this is uh, a trilogy by John Banville, the Irish writer who won the Booker Prize. He's not exactly known for his interest in science, and yet some of his earlier work um, is historical fiction around the, uh, the astronomers uh, Copernicus and Kepler, who were the first guys to come up with a theory of the solar system that had the sun at the center of it. And what I really like about John Banville's books is that it kind of, he's, he, he imagines their world and how these, um, how these men who have one foot in medieval times and one foot in modern times um, used their imagination to sort of stretch the boundaries of the known universe, if you like, and go beyond the, sort of the Earth-based uh, uh, solar system. Um, so I, I, I want to just give, uh, so I don't want to do too many readings tonight, but I want to give a couple of examples of some really beautiful writing that John Banfield has, especially uh, the middle book in this trilogy uh, is called Kepler, and it's all set from Kepler's point of view, and it really describes and explains how he comes up with his uh, uh, laws of planetary motion. So he was the first guy to uh, point out that the planets moved in ellipses around the sun. And so he took Copernicus's uh, solar, uh, sort of sun-based solar system 
which wasn't looked very nice on paper, but didn't actually work very well. And the mistake that Copernicus made was to have circles, sort of perfect circles, rather than ellipses. And once Kepler realized that, in fact, uh, planets moved in sort of these elongated ellipses around the sun, then he could uh, sort of explain and predict their motions very nicely and very accurately. But it's very interesting what John Banville does. As I said, he manages to show us how these guys, although they are underpinning modern science, uh, what motivated them wasn't necessarily what we would recognize as being a scientific motivation. And if I can find the right page, yes, I'll, uh, so this explains, this kind of explains and inhabits Kepler's mind very nicely. It's so it, this is all set from Kepler's point of view. This is Kepler. He was after the eternal laws that govern the harmony of the world. Through awful thickets in darkest night, he stalked his fabulous prey. Only the stealthiest of hunters had been vouchsafed as shot at it, and he, grossly armed with a blunderbuss of his defective mathematics, what chance had he? Crowded round by capering clowns, hallowing and howling and banging their bells, his names were paternity and responsibility and domestic goddamnicity. Yet, oh, he had seen it once briefly, that mythic bird, a speck, no more than a speck, soaring at an immense height. It was not to be forgotten, that glimpse. The 19th of July, 1595, at 27 minutes precisely past 11 in the morning, that was the moment. He was then, if his calculations were accurate, 23 years, 6 months, 3 weeks, 1 day, 20 hours, and 57 minutes, give or take a few tens of seconds old. Afterwards, he spent much time poring over these figures, searching out hidden significances. The set of date and time added together gave a product, 1,652. Nothing there that he could see. Combining the integers of that total, he got 14, which was twice seven, the mystical number. Well, perhaps it was simply that 1652 was to be the year of his death. He would be 81. He laughed with his health. He turned to the second set, his age, on that momentous July day. These figures were hardly more promising. Combined, not counting the year, they made a quantity his only significance seemed to be that it was divisible by five leaving him the product 22, the age at which he had left Tübingen. Well, that was not much. But if he halved 22 and subtracted five, that five again, he got six, and it was a six that he had been taken by his mother to the top of Gallows Hill to view the comets of 1577. And five, what did that busy five signify? Why, it was a number of intervals between the planets, the number of notes in the arpeggio of the spheres, the five-tone scale, the world's music if his calculations were accurate. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but it really briefly and sort of nicely um, illustrates what drove Kepler. He was desperate to show that the, uh, that the distances between the planets were related to, uh, sort of, to um, uh, the gaps between the scale, musical scales, and also to the idea of perfect platonic spheres and shapes. Do you want yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I think the story of Kepler and his motivations is one of the things that's fascinated me, um, not admittedly through um, fiction writing, um, I must have a read now of, of John Banville, but looking at one of the strongest influences on me um, as a teenager, thinking what I might want to do after leaving school, was um, Carl Sagan's Cosmos. And I think above all, what I liked about Cosmos wasn't just the focus on all the modern amazing discoveries, which actually Cosmos hasn't dated all that much, even though it was out in the 80s and we've learned a lot more since then, it stands up pretty well. But what for me it did extremely well too, was to give an insight into um, ancient astronomers and their motivations and, and, and what made them tick. And it's interesting how, I guess, how even in not quite so ancient people like Lord Kelvin or James Clerk Maxwell, um, who's uh, remarkably poorly known in Scotland despite being one of the most famous physicist there is, how even 100, 150 years ago, that the way that science was done seems very different from how it's done now. 
uh, and maybe literature is a good way to, to give us a, a, an insight into that. I think that's right, and I think it's too easy to be a bit complacent if you're a scientist and you're working with the sort of beautiful laws of physics, um, to be a bit complacent about what, what actually kind of underpins them in a sense, or what, where they sprung from. They can spring from what, to our mind, seems to be a very sort of wrong-headed type of logic, but it, it got us to where we are now. And the, the, same is, the same is actually true of Newton and his beautiful synthesis. So Newton took Kepler's laws, which are very empirical, and didn't really have any kind of understanding of the nature of, the, of what, was, what was making the planets move and he came up with this idea of the force of gravity and it's clear, it was clear both to his contemporaries and also to us that this is a very mysterious force. Newton himself couldn't explain it, couldn't explain what caused it and yet his contemporaries accepted it because it worked. Uh, it was fantastic and it was the first real synthesis of the motions of the planets of what happened out there with what happened on the earth. And in that way, Newton was a great sort of unifier, and that really kind of set the scale, for, set the sort of stage for how sort of physicists work in trying to unify different phenomena. So that kind of brings me on to another good example of fiction that explores the kind of historical aspects of astronomy. And this is very different to John Banville's work. It's not so obviously literary in its intent or in its uh, impact. Uh, it's a trilogy of novels written by Stuart Clark. Um, well, I've got one of them, I've got the last one with me. And Stuart was and is an astronomer, and he's probably best known for his non-fiction work. But he was very keen to uh, sort of e examine history of astronomy, again from Kepler and Galileo onwards through Newton to Einstein and Hubble. And again, he does so very nicely in a very sort of imaginative way. And what he does really cleverly is weave together the different stories so he shows you science as a sort of common enterprise and he shows you the way that uh, Newton for example sort of interacted with his contemporaries with Edmund Halley his champion and with uh, Robert Hooke his, his nemesis his enemy Newton was very good at making enemies with practically everyone and it, was, it, was, it, seemed, it seems a very sort of dislikable man but it also shows very well the sort of rather peculiar uh, religious motivation behind much of his work, this idea that the universe was this great sort of mysterious uh, thing invented by God and that the, the idea of this gravitational force was essentially a, sort of a, 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 religious, uh, a, a religious force. Um, and one, really, that could have got him into a great deal of trouble because uh, um, <clears throat> he, he didn't hold very orthodox views. Um, so, um, so that that's uh, so that that's a kind of good example of uh, sort of historical fiction where we're looking at people who who got it right. Um, so sort of, uh, I think another thing that fiction can do is examine what happens when things go wrong. And a sort of famous example of the of the canals of Mars. I, I don't know whether Martin we want to sort of explain that. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll very quickly say a little bit. If you don't know the story of the canals of Mars, um, I guess it's a very good demonstration of how good the human brain is at finding patterns, even when they're not there. Um, because one of the astronomers who studied Mars um, in the early 20th century was called Percival Lowell, and um, he uh, famously made sketches which, to his eyes, indicated that there was very regular structure in um, the features that he saw on the surface of Mars using a telescope which by today's standards probably wasn't uh, perhaps very good but at the time was among the most powerful there were. We hadn't travelled to Mars to see it close up so Lowell's sketches were about as good as we had but sadly um, they were really just um, wishful thinking because what they were showing we think is just changes in, well in fact, I shouldn't say we think we're more or less certain unless those Martians have been extremely um, uh, cunning in, in, in shielding uh, their constructions from more modern explorations of the planet. But what, what we think they were was just um, essentially changes in the contrast, um, perhaps just due to the wind patterns and the changing seasons, uh, changes in the contrast of the, the light and dark patches of the Martian desert. Mars is basically a dead world 
very um, dry and arid. Um, it may have had life in the past, but we certainly don't think it has life now. And yet this observation of the canals, as imagined by Lowell, you know, it's found its way into, well, maybe the most famous example is H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Um, but there's another example which I think Pip is going to tell us about now. So this is an American book which came out a couple of years ago. It's called Equilateral by a writer called Ken Kalfus. And it's very interesting because it takes this sort of wrong-headed science and it uses it uh, to a, a sort of imagine a scenario in which uh, people on Earth are trying to communicate with these Martians. And what they do is they build a gigantic equilateral triangle in the Egyptian desert with the idea of filling each of the three trenches that, makes, that make up the three sides of the triangle with, with burning fuel so that it can be seen uh, by these uh, imagined beings on Mars. And this all, this all takes place at the end of the 19th century and has been dreamt up by, um, by, uh, by an American astronomer who's based out in Egypt. But of course, it's not the Americans digging the trenches in Egypt, it's the Egyptians. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's done very nicely, of course, the satire is, of course, that these Americans, the, the Western uh, scientists are very keen to communicate to the Martians, when in fact they can't communicate properly to the Egyptians. And so it's, it's, a, it's essentially a colonial satire, as well as being an sort of interesting examination of the sort of wrong-headed astronomy. And of course, you imagine it, it doesn't really uh, end up very well at all. So another thing that... Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sure, I'm just, just going to briefly follow that up with something we can maybe deal with in just a matter of a few minutes, but um, taking a, a very liberal view of, of what is, is uh, across the literary spectrum, um, I feel... And my daughter would be unhappy if I didn't at least briefly mention J.K. Rowling. Um, and in, in fact, I remember reading her a few years ago, um, one of the Harry Potter novels, I think it was Goblet of Fire, and they're on their way up to the astronomy tower to do some homework, and it's midnight, and their homework assignment is to observe Venus. And my blood pressure was slowly rising as I was reading that paragraph. Now, for many in the room, that might have just completely passed you by, but if you think about it, Venus's orbit is inside the Earth. No, not literally inside the Earth, inside the Earth's orbit, and let me get that right, which means it would be impossible to see Venus at midnight because it would need to be on the opposite side of the sky from the sun. Now, as I explained that to my eight-year-old daughter, she wasn't terribly impressed, but that's an example of where you might ask the question, does it really matter if you get a detail like that wrong? And yet it's fair to say that there are some authors out there that really care about getting those kind of details correct. Now, you know, J.K. Rowling isn't one of them, but you know, I suppose it's maybe for a scientist to worry about a detail like that while they're busy casting spells right, left and centre is maybe um, uh, you know, getting your priorities slightly wrong. There are still great stories and I still like the films, but um, I wonder if Pippa could, could offer her comments on you know, times where you feel it perhaps is forgivable to get the science a bit wrong in order that the, the narrative of the story can be driven forward more effectively. Oh, that's a good point. And perhaps in a sort of fantasy or, or novel that is structured so strongly around magic, it might be, it, it, it is more forgivable in a sense. You, you, can, you can distort the science. Um, you, you, can always doing it, you can always do it knowingly. You can always distort the science knowingly uh, for the sake of the story. Uh, but I think uh, you have to know what you're doing. Um, I think it, it, it depends on what the, the purpose of the novel is. For example, if you're, if you're writing a, a novel that really uh, sort of hinges on a specific bit of science, and you better get that, so, that science right. If it's more incidental to setting the, the mood of the book, then you can probably get away with it. But I think it, it's, where, when you're a writer, you need to recognize that there are different audiences for your work. There is never one sort of uh, monolithic audience that has the same thoughts and feelings. And that, that much is apparent every time you look at Amazon. Every time you look at Amazon, for example, readers' feedback on the book, it always varies hugely. And so if you use information in a certain way, then different people will have different responses to it. Um, <clears throat> and as writers, you need to sort of bear that in mind. And it's quite embarrassing, actually. My, so my first novel is called the falling sky and really opens up the sort of astronomical process what i wanted to write about was how it felt 
to do astronomy at a remote observatory and what it felt like to sort of go there night after night to an astronomy uh, observatory in Chile and use the telescopes there and be surrounded by this very barren sort of rocky landscape. And so the accuracy of that was very important to me and it was underpinned by my own background of having done that, having been to Chile a few times and to other uh, observatories. But it's quite embarrassing, actually, to admit that I, I got some other incidental details wrong in the book. I put a star in the wrong constellation. Uh, and this was only pointed out to me by a reader who wrote to me and said, I thought you were a real astronomer, but you're just an astrophysicist, which I think is, uh, <laughs> it's got to go down as one of the best reader's comments ever. school, it doesn't but so I think that kind of brings us on to uh, sort of another subset of literature, if you like. So we, we've, we've sort of talked a little bit about historical literature. Uh, there's a subset of literature that is sometimes called lab lit that is very much preoccupied by the scientific process as it is now. And it's championed by a website run by a biologist called Jenny Roan, uh, which is a terrific website. And it's where I, I've, I've been published myself. And it's really where I'd, I'd sort of um, put my own novel. Um, I want to read out a very short section of it, which is set at this uh, Chilean observatory to explain what I was trying to do. So I was trying to explain not only the process of how you use a big telescope in a professional observatory, I was also trying to get across the emotions of how it feels when you're out there surrounded by all that rock and dust and, and uh, light and nothing else. So this is a very short extract from near the beginning of the book, so I don't need to introduce it too much. Jeanette is the main character, and she's a female, a female astronomer, obviously, and she's there in Chile, and she discovers something rather bizarre uh, about two galaxies that drives the rest of the plot. But for now, she's just in Chile. On the first evening of her week-long observing run in Chile, Jeanette stands on the mountaintop, examining her reflection in the metal dome. There's nothing else here. No people, apart from the astronomers and the support staff. No buildings, apart from telescopes, where they work at night, and a residential lodge, where they sleep during the day in a curious inversion of normal life, like a photographic negative. As the light drains from the sky, she hurries back inside to the control room to continue working with Maggie. Sunset is a precariously narrow time, trapped between the fat certainties of day and night. Each evening they compete against the darkening sky to ensure that the telescope is set up correctly so that none of the precious night is wasted. At this telescope, the control room is off to one side, curved around the edge of the dome which houses the telescope. The astronomers and the telescope operator sit in this room all night, sending instructions to the telescope and scrutinizing the resulting images. There are no windows in the control room, so it feels small and claustrophobic. There is no way of actually looking at the night sky unless you go outside. She couldn't believe this on her first observing run. It seemed nonsensical to cross the world to use a telescope and not even be able to look through it. Now she's resigned to the fact that the only way of understanding the world is to see it displayed in rectangles on the computer screen. She still wishes they could work inside the dome, but this hasn't happened in Chile for several years now. The heat from their bodies would make the air shiver and distort the images formed by the telescope mirrors, so they're hidden away. They don't talk much to each other at this early stage. Maggie tells the telescope operator how they want to use the telescope and gives him the list of coordinates of their galaxies. Then the first image of the night appears, two galaxies entwined with their dense white centers twisted by tidal forces. It's easy to see the dynamics of this interaction the gravitational attraction between the galaxies making them move towards each other and most likely merge together in the future after some unimaginably long period of time. But the image isn't quite right. The light from the galaxy centers spills over to contaminate the fainter outer regions which aren't showing up well. Jeanette and Maggie adjust exposure times and try again. Jeanette's worried that the setup of the telescope is wrong, that the observations won't work. And then she wonders why she's worried about this. If things won't work out, if she can't get another job, this may be her last trip to Chile. 
understanding galaxy evolution is such a small thing to worry about compared to the rest of her life. But the next image is stunning. The galaxies look like underwater creatures, trailing ghostly arms through the black sea of the sky. Jeanette starts to relax. It will work. She has a future. So there, I really wanted to get a sense of how, how difficult it is to actually be in that kind of uh, environment, a long way from uh, anywhere, and uh, how difficult it is also to actually set up the scientific equipment. It's not straightforward to make images in astronomy. You're always sort of struggling at the edge of what the equipment can do. And that's not always apparent when you look at uh, the sort of latest beautiful images from Hubble. So I really wanted to show the kind of the uncertainty, the difficulty of, of working with, with technology. <clears throat> I guess having mentioned GK Rowling earlier, if we extend the spectrum of literature even wider, and I suppose as a fan of the Big Bang Theory on TV, they'd be very happy that I do this. There's also comic books, and one that really has come along since I myself was a PhD student, but it's astonishing within our community what its reach is, is PhD comics, and the fact that I think they capture very beautifully some of the anxieties and almost paranoia that might exist as you alluded to very briefly in that extract, and when you're at a stage in your career, you're not quite sure where it's going. And I imagine if you're stuck working through the night at one of these remote telescopes, that maybe just accentuates that feeling of, um, of, of anxiety as to, 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 you know, what's it all about? Why am I here? What's the point of all this? Um, I'm reminded, in fact, of another book I think would also fall very much within that lab-lit spectrum which I liked very much and read when I was a PhD student, um, Gregory Benford's Timescape. Um, I don't know if anyone um, here has, has read that one. And I actually went back and read it quite recently because I forget the name of the main character, but there's a nice section where he talks about, um, or, or just paints a picture of what life in the lab is like, especially for the kind of lab director, if you like, and, and emphasizes how much of the day is taken up with teaching duties and writing grant applications and dealing with administrators. But then once all the admin people have gone home, he could settle down for the evening and actually get some proper work done. And I think that's something that was kind of lost on me when I was a grad student, but I very much appreciate now. Um, so again, given that um, there's a, a number, or, you know, a subset, as you put it, of literature out there, which really does try to um, capture um, what it is like to be a working scientist in, in the modern day. Um, can, can you think of any other examples of, of that sort of fiction that have been particularly striking for you? There's a sort of going out from astronomy, there's a, there's a wonderful book called Brazzaville Beach by the writer William Boyd, which looks at uh, scientists working in Africa uh, studying chimpanzees. And uh, I like this book very much and it influenced my own work because it's about scientists making an unexpected discovery and how it impacts not only on the science but also on the rest of their lives too. So that's a terrific example. Um, I think also sort of uh, bringing this perhaps slightly closer to home to uh, Scottish science, both in uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow, um, I wanted just to sort of say a little bit about... Um, how fiction can open up the sort of rather peculiar bits of history that aren't necessarily well known, even to scientists sort of working in those institutes. And there's, there's one really sort of bizarre example. There's an observatory in Edinburgh, the Royal Observatory Edinburgh, which is on Blackford Hill, and it's a sort of this large Victorian uh, sort of heap of, uh, of red stone with copper domes. And it's, uh, it was founded in the late 19th century, and it looks, you know, it looks like a sort of like a pillar of the establishment. What is not well known is that in 1913, just before the outbreak of the First World War, and during the height of the suffragette campaign, sort of civil disobedience campaign, if you like, uh, the observatory was bombed by suffragettes. And it did a substantial amount of damage to one of the two towers, the West Tower, to the, uh, to the telescope inside and to the brickwork. And you can still, to this day, see a kind of scar in the brickwork. And when I was a student uh, at, the, um, at the observatory, it was always sort of, uh, people knew a, li a little bit about, about the suffragette attack, but no one really knew what the motivation for it was, why suffragettes had um, sort of targeted the observatory. And what was not well known either was the fact that there had been women working at the observatory. It was a very... Uh, 
the Astronomer Royal Observatory, and all the astronomers were men. Uh, but they hired women briefly around about that time to do very sort of mechanical calculations, the type of things that we would nowadays do with a digital computer. And the people who did those calculations were called computers. And it was uh, in sort of fairly boring work, very mindless boring work, but there were women working there. And so I wrote a short story in my recent uh, collection which really kind of e examines the sort of motivation and mindset of the, of the two or three women working in this place and what they must have felt at the time. It's kind of an optimistic story because despite the violence and the implicit differences between the men and women working there, it's, uh, it ends with a sort of slight uh, vision of the future. I don't know whether you wanted to add something about that, the, sort of the, the wider history of what we know. <coughs> Sure. Um, well, would you like to, to read us a little bit of that and talk about the, your, your speculation as to what the motivation for the suffragettes might have been? I certainly, for one, had not known that story. And um, I guess I'm sometimes reminded when I visit the Royal Observatory that unlike Glasgow Uni, which are, okay, is publicly funded, the Royal Observatory, there's a more direct connection to sort of the government, if you like. It's a government-run institution. Because every time you go into the gatehouse, they tell you what the current level of threat is. And it never seems to be anything less than severe. Um, and I always worry that I'm going to look like a terrorist when I arrive there. But fortunately, um, it never seems to be too bad that they have actually recognised who I am by now. Uh, so I'll pass the microphone back to Pippa. So this is just a short extract from this historical uh, short story set around the time of the suffragette bombing. It's from the point of view of one of the young women who has just started working at the observatory, um, one of the computers. There are three of us computers, myself, Flora and Jeannie. Flora is my age and Jeannie is a bit older. She's been a teacher but thinks this is better work, quieter and more peaceful. She says the children give her dreadful headaches. Flora finds it difficult to walk up the hill and arrives red-faced and perspiring each morning. They are nice girls and we do well together in our little room with Mr. Story to guide us. I asked them what would happen when we finished looking at all the stars and they laughed at me. The stars do not end, said Jeannie. They go on forever. Nonsense, said Flora. They must end. But there are still so many of them that we will have enough work for the rest of our lives. Even though they could not agree on a number of stars, I was very relieved at the thought of being able to stay here, for I do not well know what else I could do apart from teaching, or even worse, being a governess. My friend from school, Agnes, is a lady's companion now, and she said it is quite agreeable, but the lady does go on at her so about her manners and style. She's not required to do much, other than accompany the lady to other ladies' houses, and sit silently while they gossip about yet more ladies. It sounded deadly dull to me, but when I tried to tell her about my work, she said looking at black lines all day was very peculiar and would make her feel faint. I do not think it is peculiar. The stars must be so far away that it seems remarkable to me that we can look at them and turn them into black lines and then into numbers. It's like magic, except this is science, which is supposed to be the opposite of magic. I asked Mr. Story if, he could, if we could look at the planets in the same way on our photographic plates, but he said no. I was asking him because I wanted to have a proper scientific conversation with him, the way that I have overheard him talk with the Astronomer Royal, although I am not even sure what a planet really is. But sometimes when I walk home down the hill in winter and the stars are already out, although it's very cold and I wrap up my face against the east wind, I can see Jupiter, a big yellow ball. Mr. Story takes away our books once a week. I would like to know what he does with them. It seems odd entering all these numbers for someone else to read and understand. I wonder if the Astronomer Royal himself studies our books. He does not talk to us. Well, one of the real astronomers who did exactly that, look at all those black lines and photographs, uh, Wilhelmina Fleming, um, born in Dundee. She was a um, computer in the Harvard Observatory and indeed went on to make some quite remarkable um, discoveries and deductions about the patterns inherent in all of those black lines. So although I suppose from the modern perspective it seems so bizarre to think of um, these women, all they got to do all day was record these numbers, it's quite gratifying at least to see 
that in some cases they were given the opportunity to um, bring some insights of their own and they were taken seriously and listened to. Um, so I guess we don't quite know what must have um, motivated those suffragettes, but it's uh, interesting to think that even something as apparently harmless as doing astronomy research attracted their, um, their attention in 1913.